Well, good morning. If you've got your Bibles, turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. If you don't have a Bible, raise your hand. We'd love to put one in your hand. And, uh, and feel free to take it home with you. It's important that you follow along. Don't just believe what I have to say. You just might be deceived. That's the title of the message. Be not deceived. Be not deceived. It is a blessing uh, seeing all of the, uh, uh, the folks and what God's doing in our, our little church. He is growing us up. It's neat. It's exciting. We've got a great ministry to kids and the families. That's a, that's a wonderful thing. So we've made it through 1 Thessalonians. We're in 2 Thessalonians, now chapter 2, 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 5 this morning. And the title of the message is, Be Not Deceived. Our passage this morning, Paul will again continue to talk more about the rapture of the church and its implications, giving more clarity on the subject to the church in Thessalonica that still has many questions. This event is called in Scripture the blessed hope of the church. It is a promise. Therefore, it's only fitting that the church finds hope in this promise. Both the church in Thessalonica and the church today, 2,000 years later, But before we can read our text this morning in chapter 2, we need to be clear that Scripture teaches that there are two second comings. You say, what? Or literally, coming of our Lord Jesus Christ as mentioned in the Bible. The first is this rapture, spoken of here and other places as the gathering together of the saints or the people of God or the children of God. Simply put, those who are saved. The second return is a return for judgment with the saints. We know at the end of that seven-year tribulation period, he comes with judgment. The first, he's coming to gather together his saints. The first happens at an unexpected time. We don't know. He comes as a thief in the night, we're told. The second, well, it happens at an expected time. He comes at the end of that seven-year tribulation period, and it's pretty powerful. There is much difference between these two events, and we've been talking about the differences thus far. And we will again, we'll see more regarding these differences in our passage this morning. So let's read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the first five verses. But now, brethren... Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple of God showing himself that he is God do you not remember that when I was still with you I told you these things wow we have a church in Thessalonica In the first century, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians are the first epistles written by the Apostle Paul from Corinth. We've been talking about that. He stayed longer in Corinth this first time, longer than he'd ever stayed any place where he'd planted a church. I mean, he got run out of town after three weeks. After him and Silas left Philippi, they showed up in Thessalonica, and he only had three weeks to pour into these people, to get them saved, and to teach them all kinds of doctrine. I've been talking about how amazed I am at the things that they were able, he was able to teach them, the things they were able to grasp in three weeks. I mean, just salvation, think about it. Just explaining the work of salvation in in just three Sundays. Obviously, they must have been meeting every night, right, 24 hours a day. 
I could imagine. But here he's talking about doctrine and eschatology and end times. I mean, he was equipping them. But no doubt that the fact that Paul was only there three weeks before he ran out of town leads to the fact that they had many questions. They were concerned. They believed or had been mistaught, misled, or deceived into thinking that the rapture had already taken place and that they were in the first three and a half years of the tribulation period. Now, I got to say, sometimes we think, Lord, you know, when you're having a bad day, you're like, man, did I miss the rapture? <laughs> Am I living in the tribulation? Because it's tough. You know, I mean, it's like you're waiting for it's like fire to fall from the sky and just, you know, it's the only, you know, it's crazy. But here they just were just lacking that understanding. It's important regarding the coming of that day, Paul did not want these believers to be shaken. The word shaken means to be agitated or shaken or to have a cause to be tottered or to and fro. The, the word speaks of a ship that's just being thrown around by the waves in the ocean by a storm. Don't be shaken or soon or literally quickly shaken. Don't be shaken concerning the coming of our Lord and the gathering together with him. Concerning this, Paul here addresses questions raised by his first letter where he instructed the Thessalonians about this catching away, this rapturus, the Latin, Greek, uh, Latin Vulgate where we get the word rapturus. You know, people say, well, rapture is not in the Bible. Well, that, that Greek word caught up is translated in the Latin Vulgate, rapturus. And so our translators have put rapture in there. <clears throat> it's catching away with, to be with Jesus. Now, but the challenge in understanding this chapter comes from the fact that is, is, it's an addition to what Paul has already said, both when he spoke and taught them personally for that three and a half weeks and what he said in the first epistle. Now, we don't know. We speculate what he taught them in those three and a half weeks, but we know what he taught them in 1 Thessalonians. So we'll be looking at that. Now, Hebrews 10.25 says this, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some, but exhort one another, and so much more, listen, as you see the day approaching. What day? This day, this day of the Lord. Now the exhortation comes right here in verse 1, right? Concerning the coming of our Lord and the gathering together of the saints. You know, we're excited about that. We're going to talk a lot about that gathering together. But you know, Hebrews here says, look, some forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Look, there is something spiritual happening right here together. And we're not going to make it to that place where we are gathered together with him, this rapture, if we're not spending time together here. There's something special that happens here. You know, church is important. Look, if you think you can just receive Jesus and crawl under a rock someplace and just ride it out till the day of the Lord, chances are you're not going to make it. It's hard. It's difficult. We need to be taught. We need to be instructed. We need to be encouraged. We need to be exhorted. We need to have the fellowship and the communion we have together. There's something spiritual happening here. Therefore, we're not to neglect the gathering together. To neglect this would be to neglect that. And if I'm neglecting that, how am I going to be there on that coming day, the day of the Lord? So, let's go back. Let's look at what Paul had previously said in 1 Thessalonians. I'm going to call out some verses a, 1 Thessalonians 2.13. The church of Jesus will return, or the church Jesus is returning for to gather to himself is one that has received the word of God and has welcomed it, not as the words of men, 
but the words of truth. That's what he's saying there. B, in 1 Thessalonians 2, 4 through 16, and in 1, 3, 1 Thessalonians 3, 3 through 4, both those passages is described the church that Jesus is returning for and coming back for, gathering together to himself, is one who has endured and even at times suffered and has persevered in difficulty. See, 1 Thessalonians 3.12 and 2 Thessalonians 1.3 speaks about this church that he's gathering to himself as one that is abiding in love, love for one another, this amazing love all through. D, 1 Thessalonians 3, 13, and 1 Thessalonians 4, 7 speaks of this church that he's gathering to himself as one that is holy and standing blameless before the Lord. And E, 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 speaks of the church that he's coming back for as one that is living in obedience. Our sanctification, in other words, is a big deal. And in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, all the way through 5, Paul is going to answer some questions regarding the topic. Let's go back to 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 and read what he said. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those, or, you know, ignorant means uninformed, concerning those who have fallen asleep or have passed away, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord. I like that. No deception. That we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will, what, descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up, there's your word for rapture, together, there's the word, caught up together. As he's saying in our passage this morning, Lost my place. I looked up. (laughs) Where am I? Oh, there I am. Together with them in the cloud to meet the Lord in the air. Thus, we shall always be with the Lord. What a comforting thought. You see, so their thought was that, one, we're we're here. Their first question that he answers is, well, what's happened to those who have died? You know, we've missed the rapture. Their first concern with those who've passed away, those who are asleep. And so he explains that here in our passage. And, and he brings it all together as this catching up. This day of the Lord. Once again, in 13, we have hope. In 14 and 15, Paul says, this is what that hope looks like, whether we sleep or whether we live. At the bottom of 17, and we shall for always be with the Lord. This is a completely different event than the coming of Christ at the end of the seven-year tribulation period. And once again, Paul's concern is that they are not soon or quickly shaken by this. Now, as we look at this passage here, back in 2 Thessalonians 2, he says not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, he says here. Not to be soon shaken. We talked about how what that shaken, what that word means in opening. Don't be, don't be moved around. Don't be tottered. But here in mind, literally means the power of considering and judging soberly or calmly what's right and wrong. We've got to have the ability to discern by the word of God what is true and what's not true. 
in order to escape or not fall into some kind of trap of deception regarding false teaching and other things. Or even the enemy, because you see, the enemy wants to deceive. That's his MO. That's, that's, he's a deceiver. The scripture tells us he's been like that forever. That's what he wants to do. And he wants to deceive us. Not only by like some false doctrine or, or a false prophet, false teacher, but even he's deceiving our, our minds. It, did, you know, you ever, did Jesus really die on the cross for my sins? You know, I mean, am I really saved? What's the question? I don't know. I've got questions. And if you neglect that gathering, those, those things, that deception can creep in. The enemy wants to creep in. And, and just like Jesus, after the baptism, right, what happened? To be with the Lord, he escaped off to the desert. That was between uh, uh, Jerusalem and the Dead Sea as he came up from the Jordan. And he went up, and it says the enemy led him up to a high hill. He's in prayer. And he tried to deceive the Son of God, the Messiah, from doing what he came to do. If the enemy wants to, it, it, you know, he's not afraid of trying to deceive Christ and get inside his head, don't you think he wants to get inside yours sometimes and make you believe things that aren't true? That happens a lot to us. Romans 12.2. In fact, it says, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, listen, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. The enemy wants to conform your mind into his will or his character. Sounds a lot like deception, doesn't it? And the warning there in 12.2 is don't be deceived. Allow God to transform your mind and renew your mind. In the words, you're troubled. To be troubled in mind, to be frightened or alarmed. You know, to be afraid. It's easy to say that this church was afraid. They were fearful. Let's just think about it just for a minute. You're a believer this morning. If fear had crept in somehow and false teaching and, you and, and life was really, really hard... And for some reason, you thought that the rapture, you've been told the rapture had taken place, the blessed hope of the church, the day of the Lord that Paul had taught you about. If you really believed that had happened, don't you think you'd be afraid? You'd be fearing for those who, who you love who'd passed away, and then you'd be afraid for yourself. You would seriously be troubled. This looks a lot like fear. And fear is not from God, is it? It's not. But deception is from the enemy. Turn to Matthew 24, 6. Speaking of this time, let's start in verse 5. Start in verse 4. <laughs> Matthew 24, 4. And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled. There's the word. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and pestilence, earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. So I'm a big pre-trib rapture guy. He's coming back for the church. We're not appointed under wrath. We're going to look at that scripture. But unto salvation. God's grace is rich on those who are his. But this is the thing. Don't think that it's not going to get hard. That there's not going to be times of struggles that you're going to have to use some serious discernment and choose this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. I mean, you're going to have to make a stand before this rapture takes place. Even now, think about the difficulties that are coming upon people, kids at church. Look at the stuff that's going on in college campuses, in the workplace. I mean, you do, that's a whole nother, I'm not going to get on that soapbox. That's just crazy. 
So remember what First, first Thessalonians 5, 1 through 3 says. It will be sudden. Therefore, we have no concern for the time of the season, he says. But if you must know, then he goes on to 1 Thessalonians 5, 4. This day will not overtake you as a thief, as he's coming as a thief in the night. But you won't be overtaken. But remember, he's coming as a thief in the night. He's coming unexpectedly, 1 Thessalonians 5, 5, because all of you are sons of light. Listen, if you're born again, if you're walking in Jesus, this, you don't need to be afraid of this. But we don't need to be preppers in the material sense. But what he's saying is we need to be preppers right here. Are you prepping your heart? Are you preparing your heart for this day? Stay connected to the vine. The answers of truth, light, and love. That's it. Don't be deceived. For God is not mocked. First Thessalonians 5, 6 through 8. So he tells us, watch, be ready. A couple weeks ago I brought up the parable, right? There in Matthew 25 of the ten virgins. Five were wise, five were foolish. They were waiting. These virgins were waiting for the bridegroom, right? Which is, the, which is Christ. He, it's a picture. He's our bridegroom. Waiting for him to come. They didn't know. He could come at an unexpected time, this bridegroom. So they had these lamps, and they, they would keep their oil, and they'd trim their lamps. Well, the foolish ones, ah, they didn't consider. They didn't prepare their hearts for the coming of the bridegroom. So they allowed their oils to run dry. And the wise ones, man, they packed enough oil. They packed it. The Lord might tarry for another hundred years. I don't think he will. But are you packing? Are you packing enough oil to get you through? A wise, the wise ones were. The foolish ones didn't consider it. And he came. And the foolish ones were left outside. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 says, But add to that even, God has not appointed us under wrath, as I said, but to obtain salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what you've been, been gifted and grafted into and given Where's the fear in that? It's perfect love casts out all fear. And that's what we have here. This church is experiencing fear. They're shaken. They're being moved. Their fears were centered on the idea that Christ had come. What a horrible thing. And then he goes on. Back to 2 Thessalonians. I'm doing much better on time than I did um, for service. So. Hmm. I must say, he says here, don't be shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if it was from us. As though the day of Christ, your Bible somebody said the day of Christ, better literal translations, day of the Lord had come. Shaken in mind and troubled. Tr troubled either, either in spirit or even in word. Now, listen, they didn't have the, the New Testament. They had the Old Testament. The New Testament was being written. Again, like I said, it was written. It's being written on the lives and the hearts of the church in Thessalonica. They are our New Testament. They don't even know it. But here, he says, look, this spirit, as, as if, you know, the spirit's coming in, in in some kind of false way, through false teaching, false prophecy, false apostles, and even it's been said and believed that when he's talking about even by a letter as if it was from us, some believe that he was coming in with a false letter, some were coming in with a false letter and a forged letter by Paul. Saying, hey, and pa Paul's saying all this. When Paul's like, I wasn't saying any of that. Isn't that the way the enemy works? Isn't that the way deception works? Don't you just hate it when someone puts words in your mouth? Especially things you don't believe and you've never said. Therefore, the enemy was deceiving this church. I think we need to be careful between now and that. We need to start being careful now. Between now and, and the, this day of the Lord. Be a Berean. Check it out. You've got a Bible. At least for right now, you do. 
Amen? Read it. Verse 3. So then he goes on, and because of all of this, he's saying, and don't be deceived. Don't let no one, don't let anyone deceive you by any means. In the Greek, that's pretty, pretty, it's like what it says, it's pretty harsh. He said, don't allow anyone by any means to deceive you. If, so, if, if, if someone looked over and told you that, then you're going to take heed to that. Look, look, don't be deceived. It means you better gird up your loins of your mind. You better be thinking about what you're saying and what you're hearing and what you're believing. Now, he says that that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. I got to tell you, in the original text, that is not there. The day will not come. In my Bible, you could go through it where there's blue highlight. It's always going to be italicized, but I always put those in blue, okay? Because that, that was added in there, and it's not, a, not an untrue statement. Don't, don't be scratching it out altogether. I highlight it so I can still see it, right? But it's, it's, it's based on the thought of that day, and when it comes, don't be deceived. But he's going to tell them now, He's not going to tell them, uh, you'll, this is why you know that the rapture hasn't taken place, by saying, because these things leading up to the rapture haven't happened. But rather, he's going to give three points of three things, three signs that happened in the first three and a half years of the tribulation period to let them know you're not in that place. Let's look at what they are. The signs of the coming day. Well, first off, I got Can we back up just for a second? Regarding let no one deceive you. I missed this. And I want to turn to it. Romans 16, 17. The pastor just got ahead of himself. You'll have to forgive me. Romans 16, 17. Paul's finishing out the, the book of Romans with these thoughts. I urge you, brethren, note those who cause division an offense contrary to doctrine or teaching which you learned and avoid them for those who are such do not serve the Lord Jesus Christ but serve their own bellies and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple for your obedience has became known to all I like that therefore I am glad on your behalf but I want you to be wise in what is good, simple concerning what is evil. And the grace and, 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 and the God of peace will, listen, crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. What a wonderful promise regarding deception. Be not deceived, but be wise, simple. That, that means be prudent in what is evil. doesn't mean not think about it it actually means think about it because in the end Satan will be crushed under your feet it's just a matter of short time let's go back to those three points that I was going to talk about the first sign regarding this three and a half years right unless the falling away comes first the Greek word here for falling away indicates rebellion or departure. There's different thoughts on this. Bible scholars debate if it refers to an apostasy, a falling away among those who once followed God, who were once saved, or a general worldwide rebellion. In fact, Paul may have both in mind, is what one writer said. You see, the Bible talks both in, about, uh, in the end times, a, a, a falling away, a departure from the faith. And at the same time, it talks about a great revival taking place. And I know some of us, we, we, we're like, how does, this, how does this happen? Well, first, in church history, the church has always grown, right? I and mean, people have gotten saved and given their lives to Jesus under great persecution. It's just the opposite. People are getting saved when times are good. 
When times get really hard, people find the Lord and give their lives to Jesus genuinely. So that doesn't surprise me. And a falling away? The chafe will be blown away. I, I, turn with me to 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 3. Just one page over. 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 3. Now the Spirit expressly says, I like that. You don't want to be deceived. Paul's, Paul's telling Timothy, the young preacher, it's this, this is by the Spirit of God. The Spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed what to what? Deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding, uh, commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and, and know the truth. There, there is this separation. You can flip over to 2 Timothy real quick. 3, 2 Timothy 3, 1. A couple, three pages over. But now, but excuse me, but now, but know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, uh, blasphemers, uh, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, un unforgiving, slanders without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, uh, you know, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, and having a form of godliness but deny its power. And from such people turn away. Go the opposite direction. It's obvious there's going to be some falling away. That's a whole other debate. Were they ever saved to begin with? Did they ever understand? That's between you and God. Okay? He's sovereign. For me, I'm grounded because I'm abiding. I'm abiding in the vine. You know, the idea is I want to abide in God and bear fruit. I don't want to die and have my family go, well, you know, there was a time when Roger gave his life to Jesus, but you know, there wasn't just much fruit in his life. We're just going to trust God's grace and his sovereign, you know, judgment on Roger's life. He was a, he was a good old boy. He'd give his shirt off his back for anybody. I don't want you saying that at my funeral. Funeral? I'm talking like a southerner. Like I got a mouthful of dip. <laughs> Don't say that. I want you to say that guy loved God. And I want you guys to rejoice. I want to rejoice at your funeral. Like, because you're, you're dying for me. No, if <laughs> I want to rejoice over the fruit of God in your life. The, I love doing funerals. I'd rather do a funeral than a wedding. For a believer, anyway. Think about it. The falling away. This, this, listen to this, the falling away. The article, the, makes it even more significant. This is not a falling away, but referred to as the falling away, the great and final rebellion. Just a thought. Second, this second sign, the man of sin is revealed. Before the great tribulation can be identified with certainty, a particular person known as the man of sin must be revealed. Paul's point is clear. You are worried that you are in the great tribulation, that you missed it. But you can know that you're not because this, this is the second reason. This man, this, right, has not been revealed yet. Now, however, listen, there is no good reason, some, right, to see this, some say, as a man. In fact, John Calvin believed that this referred to an office or system, right, rather than an individual person because he thought that the Rome, this referred to the Roman Catholic Church. Now, I'm not saying that it doesn't refer to an office or a system, but here it's speaking of an individual person who might be working in conjunction with a system I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not throwing anybody under the bus because I don't know, okay? 
But clearly speaking here, when you're, when you're pulling the word of God apart, we have to believe that he's speaking of a specific person, and we know that he's speaking of the Antichrist. Jesus described an individual person that will come on the scene. In John 5, 43, he says, I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If anyone comes in his own name, well, him you'll receive. He's talking about the Antichrist. Isn't that a shame? The light of the world, the manifestation of God in the flesh was rejected by men, and yet there'll be a day and time when a man full of Satan himself will be received by the world. That that just... Even Daniel describes this in Daniel 9.26, in Daniel 8.23, and in Daniel 11.36-45 as an individual person, this Antichrist coming on the scene. This man of sin is a prominent figure in the Bible, this Antichrist. And the ultimate personification of the spirit of the Antichrist. In fact, the word tells us that there's many Antichrists, but there's going to be one individual. And that's what this is talking about and alluding to here this morning. Referred to again as the son of perdition. The word perdition literally means destruction. Literally a a complete loss of well-being. This Antichrist is just a lost person to the, to the 10th degree. This word perdition is exactly opposite of the word salvation. And yet he'll be giving a false hope and deceiving the nations. Verse 4 of 2 Thessalonians 2 back there. Speaking of this Antichrist, the son of perdition, he says, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. I think he's got a complex. He thinks he's God. At least he wants the world to think that he's God. Regarding he who opposes and exalts, the man of sin depend, uh, uh, depends on worship, but the worship is for himself. It belongs to himself and not to God. Luke 4, 8 on the screen. And Jesus answered and said to him, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. I think it's a pretty amazing passage. This demands worship, right? This demands worship is also described in Revelation 13, 6. This antichrist that comes on the scene demanding worship. Is there any greater level of deception than that? What would you think of me if I demanded your worship? You'd be like, I'm out of here. Church would be increasing. Church would be decreasing, wouldn't it? Yeah, well, that goes both ways. I'm not worshiping you either. (laughs) He stands against and exalts himself above. He's giving himself divine divinity, divine authority. And above every object of adoration. In every institute that relates itself to divine worship. And at this time, he's, you know, this is the last sign, right, that he gives, right, regarding th- this, this Antichrist. And he's speaking of that three and a half year mark, the midway part of the tribulation period, where the Antichrist, this guy, the son of perdition, will sit in the temple of God, right, and say, worship me as God. And we know then that Israel... The Jews as a whole, I mean, not every Jew in the but as a faith, their blinders will be removed, right? Their deception will, will, will fall away. 
just as a person who doesn't believe and wakes up one morning and falls to their knees and says, Lord Jesus, come into my life. I need you. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. They're just good. When he does this, they're going to go, ah. Oh. And that marks that three and a half way point of the tribulation period. So he gives these signs right up to the halfway point, saying, you're not in this time. Fear not, you're not here. Because this is what's going to happen. Sits in the temple of God. Amazing passage. Spoken also in Daniel 9, 27, Daniel eleven thirty one, 31, Daniel 12, uh, 11. Turn with me to Matthew 24, 15. Matthew 24, 15. Speaking of this great tribulation period, listen to what he says. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, I just gave you the verses, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Don't be deceived. He's telling them, watch your deception. Then let those who are in Judah flee to the mountains and let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out. And he goes on. Don't go back, just flee. This is gonna, this is gonna mark the beginning of the second half of the tribulation period where God judges. Look at 21 real quick in Matthew 24. For then there will be a great tribulation. We call that second three and a half years the great tribulation in Scripture, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. Amazing passage. Showing himself as God is what he wants to do. Back to Thessalonians. Now look at five. I want to stop here because he says, Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? The Apostle Paul goes back to those three weeks when he was in their presence. And he's telling them, looking, look, looking, look, don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Remember what I said and remember what I've written to you. From the Spirit of God, I'm telling you the truth. Remember what I said. Sometimes I wonder, I wonder how seriously we take this. You know, we're living in a time when this is, is so applicable. It, it really applies to this day and age. You know, I don't want to run around like a chicken with my head cut off, like Chicken Little. You know, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. You know, but the word says to warn every man, to let them know this day is approaching, whether it's another hundred years or not. It's not relevant when it comes to the life of the believer. It doesn't, it's not, what's not relevant is whether it's a hundred years from now or tomorrow. What's relevant is the application in our lives. Live for the Lord. Be not deceived. Now, next week, I'm excited. Look at six. And now you know what is restraining. Listen, that he may be revealed in his own time. Speaking of the son of perdition, you know what's restraining, that he may be revealed in his, in his own time, this appointed time. What's, what are we going to find? That what is restraining... This from taking place right now. Other than God's appointed time, it is the church. It is the word of God and the spirit of God dwelling in the people of God. That just is so amazing. And I want you to think about something for a minute. Maybe you think of your life and your Christianity as pretty insignificant. It really doesn't, I mean, I'm saved, I love the Lord, but I, I'm just, it's, my faith is really is insignificant. Your faith is not insignificant. 
All of our faith together is what's restraining evil. The Holy Spirit lives inside of you. The word of God, the testimony of the gospel is yours. You own it. You're restraining evil. What if we took all the Christian kids out of public school? What would happen then? Do you think it'd make it better? What if we took Christians away out of college? That wouldn't make it better. What if we took Christians out of the workplace? What if we just put up a big fence and we all went inside there? You know, and we only hung out together. That's not biblical. Because, you see, God is working in us, leading people to faith, opening the eyes of the blind. Look, can I just talk to you like you're five? Don't hide your light under a bushel, no. Let your light so shine before men that they might see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. God is at work in you today. You just don't know. I am excited about next week to teach that. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are so grateful for your goodness, God, towards us. We know we're saved by grace through faith. It's not of ourselves, lest anyone has the right to boast. It's all you. There's no one here worthy, God. We don't come to you worthy. God, we come to you broken and messed up. We come to you as sinners, deserving of judgment. And yet you go ahead and you pour your life into us. That's love. And you turn around and you use us for your glory and for your purpose. And for your, 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 your power is, is working in the church today. Oh, what a glorious day. When we are gathered together with you and in you. Father, help us to not be deceived. But help us to be aware of what you're doing. Help us not live in fear. Lord, I pray that our minds wouldn't come under attack, that we wouldn't be tossed around, but we'd be standing firm in you, waiting for this day as we serve you and love hard. In Jesus' name, amen.